what's wrong with this as a historical scene? Shepherds and the kings were there together. We read about the shepherds in Luke's account and the kings, not kings really, wise men in, in Matthew's account. And, it, and we often put them two together, but it's very unlikely that they occurred at the same time. There are all sorts of things there which aren't in the Bible. In, Jesus may have been born in a stable, but we're not told so. There may have been animals present, but we're not told so. And we like to try and fit the Gospels together to create one account. But God, in his wisdom, has given us four accounts of the life of Jesus, four different pictures of Jesus viewed from different angles. We like to call them four Gospels, but that's a rather misleading way of speaking. And I'm sure I'll call them Luke's Gospel. But there is only one Gospel, one announcement of the good news, but it's presented to us as according to four different writers. And as we were saying earlier, there were other written accounts accounts, but the church recognized from the earliest days that these four were authoritative. In fact, it was a, the Bishop of Lyon, Irenaeus, writing about AD 180, who said, it's not possible that the Gospels can be either more or fewer in number than they are, for since there are four zones in the world in which we live and four principal worlds while the church is scattered through the world, it is fitting that she should have four pillars. He who was manifested to man has given us the gospel under four aspects, but bound together by one spirit. It was also the good Bishop Irenaeus who was one of the first to suggest that the four gospel accounts could be symbolized by the four faces of God that we read about in the prophet Ezekiel and again in the book of Revelation, a lion, a man, an eagle, and an ox. And he suggested that Mark gospels like a lion. Jesus is always rushing around. The key word is immediately. Jesus doing this and doing that to demonstrate his authority. Matthew, a bit like a man. It, it emphasizes God in human form. Jesus is Emmanuel in Matthew's gospel, God with us. That's the, the beginning and the end of the gospel. Uh, Luke is like an ox, steadily working. And John like an eagle, soaring above the earth, a sort of heavenly perspective. On, on Jesus' life. And we might think of an ox as, as sort of fairly demeaning, just a large, dirty, smelly farm animal. But to appreciate the picture, I think, we need to think ourselves back into first century Palestine. The, the ox was a symbol of power. Think modern day tractor. This was the ox. It was the ox that did the important work in the rural community. It was a steady, deliberate, powerful worker. And whereas the word that Mark's gospel uses to connect things is immediately, we'll see that Luke's normal phrase is, it came to pass. That phrase is used in Matthew six times, in Mark four times, in John three times, and in Luke a whopping 50 times. It came to pass. And because the ox was such a, an important animal, it was also valuable. <clears throat> The Tenth Commandment, if you remember, says you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his servant or his ox. And because it was valuable, it was the top of the tree when it came to sacrifices to God. So I think the ox is not a bad symbol for Luke's portrayal of Jesus. But as we work through the gospel in the coming year, we'll discover other important characteristics. It's Luke who focuses on the importance of prayer in Jesus' life and, and, and Jesus' teaching about prayer. It's Luke who puts more emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' birth and baptism and life. It's Luke who focuses, who emphasizes Jesus' concern for the poor and the disadvantaged. And we probably don't associate an ox with joy, but Luke's gospel is full of joy and rejoicing and parties and banquets. So the opening sentence can be, can be uh, important in setting the, the scene. And Luke's opening sentence, I think, is also an important introduction to his book. So he writes this. It's, it's four verses in their English translations, but it's one sentence in the Greek. And he writes this. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. When we come to any text or article or in a newspaper or a magazine or a blog or a post online, 
we come with questions, don't we? We come with questions. Who? Who is the writer? When? When was it written? Is it up to date? Is it still relevant? What? What is it? Is it fiction or non-fiction? Is it a reference book or poetry? How? How was it intended to be written, to be read? And why? What's, what's the purpose of the writer? And Luke's introduction helps us to answer those questions. Who? Who is the I and the I myself that Luke talks about? Luke's not named in his gospel. And the words according to Luke at the beginning are a later edition. They weren't there in the original. Now, Bible scholars don't agree about many things, but there's almost universal agreement that Luke's gospel and the Acts of the Apostles were written by the same author. And they make up just over a quarter of the New Testament. There's a big chunk, the biggest writer in the New Testament. And if you know Acts, you'll know that in a few places where Luke was a companion of Paul, the style changes from talking about they did this to we did this, or we went so and so. So there's good evidence that Luke, the companion of Paul, is the writer of both Acts and this gospel. And when Paul describes Luke in Colossians as our dear friend Luke, the doctor, so Luke, the companion of Paul, is, is the writer. What else do we know about Luke? As some have suggested that he was a, a Gentile rather than a Jew, but to my mind that seems very unlikely because his gospel is full of allusions to the Old Testament scriptures. Indeed, although this is an account of the life of Jesus, Luke sets his account within the context of, of God's plan of salvation through history. So he writes, the things that have been fulfilled among us, not something that happened just off the cuff, but the things that fit into God's plan. And the implication is that this is the work of God, continuing his plan of redeeming and restoring his creation. So when was it written? If Luke is the traveling companion of Paul and writes about Paul's imprisonment in Rome in the early 60s, then it must have been written after that, but not too many years after, or Luke would not still have been alive. So apart from this, we don't really know, but many scholars would go for a date in the 80s AD. It's not particularly important, but it's around that period. What is it? It's instructive to see what Luke claims in his introduction. He himself doesn't claim to be an eyewitness but he claims that it was based on accounts, on earlier eyewitness accounts, of which he says there were many. And one of these is likely to be, have been Mark's gospel, because the most scholars believe that that was written before Luke, and Luke had that in front of him when he wrote his, his account. About 30% of Luke's gospel appears to be based on Mark's account. And scholars have also speculated that there was another source which they call Q, sayings of Jesus, which Matthew and Luke seem to have drawn upon. But there seem to have been others because Luke draws many accounts, and we don't have a record of these. And there are, there are plenty of sort of later Gospels, but the, the, Luke wasn't referring to those. Those were composed after Luke was writing. But above all, Luke says that it's based on eyewitnesses. There was undoubtedly a period in the early church when the accounts of what Jesus did and said were communicated by word of mouth. But the eyewitnesses were there right up into the writing of the Gospels to serve as a sort of check to prevent false stories of G about Jesus uh, getting into the written text. So the Gospels are based on eyewitness testimony and therefore they're reliable. Luke also maintains that it's written as a result of careful investigation. And if we read it carefully, it's quite clear that it isn't just a number of stories about Jesus that Luke has sort of thrown together in a haphazard way. It's very carefully crafted and structured, relating Jesus' life to God's plan of salvation. And the other thing that Luke claims is that it's an orderly account. So what does he mean by that? I don't think he means that it's strictly chronological in order. I mean, after all, if you read John's Gospel, he has Jesus visiting Jerusalem three times during his ministry. But Luke only tells us of one visit. And the journey to Jerusalem is a particular feature of Luke's Gospel, as we, we'll see. It starts in chapter 9, and it, Jesus doesn't reach Jerusalem until chapter 19. There's 10 whole chapters of this journey up to Jerusalem compared with a couple in the other Gospels. 
So Luke, Luke, has his, Luke is an orderly account, but it is, it's his special order. And the importance of the town of Jerusalem is a feature of Luke's account. Jer Jerusalem is named 33 times in Luke's gospel. That's as often as it's named in the other three gospels put together. Some have suggested that Luke's writing, the structure of Luke and Acts, could be understood as the, the sort of shape of an hourglass, <clears throat> with Jerusalem as the, the center. Luke has Jesus heading for Jerusalem in, in his gospel for the key events of his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. And then the witness to these events, the, the gospel in Acts, spreading out from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, as Jesus instructed his disciples. So Ju Jerusalem is a sort of focal point of the two book. So yes, it is history. In fact, Luke goes out of his way, doesn't he, to locate the life of Jesus within the framework of the history and geography of the Roman world. But Luke has too much material to tell us about all the events of Jesus' life and all the things he said. So he has to select particular events and sayings and put them together in a way that won't just communicate the facts but more importantly, the meaning behind those facts, the meaning behind those events. So it's not just a biography, it's a theological biography. Theology literally means the word or message of God. And Luke's history of Jesus is written to tell us about God and his plan of salvation. So how? How is it intended to be read? We tend to dip into it, don't we? The story of the Good Samaritan, that's in Luke, good Sunday school lesson. Let's pick that out and talk about the story of the Good Samaritan. And that's okay on one level, but it's not what Luke had in mind. Luke wrote his gospel on a single papyrus scroll. It would have been about 10 metres in length, and it's jolly difficult to pick out the bits in the middle of a 10 metre length of scroll. Luke didn't intend it to be used in that way. He intended it to be read sequentially to groups of Christians in different churches, and they will read it in long chunks, not just a few verses here and a few verses there. And I've got a challenge for us in the new year, another New Year's resolution to add to the list. Why don't we try and find time at the start of this new year to read through Luke's gospel in one or, or perhaps two sittings? Take about two hours to do it from beginning to end. But that, that will be a great help, I think, in putting our sermons in context as we go through the year. So that's my challenge. Uh, why don't we read Luke's Gospel from beginning to end? And lastly, why, why did he write it? It's written to this um, mysterious figure, Theophilus. We don't know anything about him. But he was probably Luke's patron. Someone had to pay the bills while Luke was um, writing his gospel. Uh, it's probably Luke's patron. But Luke didn't intend it for this one person. He intended it for a much wider circulation. And he's crystal clear and upfront about why he's, it's written. It's written so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Luke is writing so that his readers would know the truth about Jesus. And the word know in the Bible often carries a wider meaning than just a sort of mental understanding. It means to know in the sense of experience. Luke is, is upfront about the fact that he's writing so that his readers would experience the truth about Jesus. And that experience is life-changing. If we experience the truth about Jesus, the truth about a, a God who loves us so much that he suffered and died for us, and wants us to devote our lives to him, to following him, then that changes everything, doesn't it? Changes everything about how we see life and how we see the world around us. So Luke writes so that we would know the truth about Jesus. And it's, it's my hope and prayer that God will, is going to use our studies of Luke in the coming year to teach each one of us more and more about the truth about Jesus.